Okay, uh, Mr. Barnett, you're going to reserve five minutes, sir? If I may, Judge. Okay, we're ready whenever you are. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning to the panel. May it please the court. Uh, good morning, counsel. Uh, judges, I, I think when you boil this case down, there, there are a lot of technical issues on the statutes that apply here. These issues of immunity all, all are complex, but when you boil the essence of the case down, I would suggest that it's, it's very simple. There's really two, two primary concerns, one of which being the very early procedural posture of the dismissal in this case. This is, if we look through the, uh, the number of um, cases cited by both parties, uh, virtually all of them um, are dealing with um, summary judgments and uh, occasions where there's been a, a trial or a finding of fact. In this case, uh, very early on, at the, the summary at the motion to dismiss level, uh, the case was dismissed. And, and so I would urge as a starting point, if nothing else, if the court uh, finds that the complaint does not sufficiently allege a uh, culpable negligence, that the uh, plaintiff ought to have the opportunity to come back and amend. But I would suggest that if you look at the the complaint and, and the, the authority that we've cited that it should be sufficient. Um, it, it strikes me though, because it seems like you're advocating for a categorical rule that so long as a plaintiff's complaint includes some kind of, you know, buzzwords that, you know, you can allege any, any act, X or Y. And as long as you allege that X or Y was criminally culpable negligence that could be punished by an excess of 60 days in jail, then no matter what X and Y may be, the complaint should go forward against the individual defendants outside of outside of workers' comp. Is it seems like that's what you're advocating here? Judge Lux, I, I don't know that I'm advocating for a, a blanket rule, but I, I do think that from a practical standpoint, it's very difficult for a plaintiff without the benefit of discovery to crystallize the issues that, that may arise for a later factual determination. Well, I think I, mean, I think that may actually inure to your benefit, because if you're on a motion to dismiss stage, you, you, you point that out. Judge, look, these are these are allegations that are to be taken in, in true in light most favorable to us uh, and, and as if they were true. And if a judge can look at those allegations and say, OK, I'm looking at them and as a matter of law, this this dog will never hunt in, in outside of workers comp. Um, you know, why, why is that inappropriate? Well, the, and the reason, Judge, for that, and I, and I appreciate the, the, the point we're drawing there, is that I think the analysis that the court was, the road that the court was taken down on that issue turned on this very specific issue of the second and first degree misdemeanor a statute. Here. And so, so that, I think, is, is the turning point. And so in this case, what, what the appellees have argued in, in the trial court, I would submit, is an overly broad, non-logical um, argument. And essentially what they, they argue, and it's very clear, and I believe we cited to specific arguments made at the trial court level, that they are in essence arguing that the managerial um, policymaking individuals had to themselves carry out uh, the act. And so I think, you know, for well, instance- You're basically in saying that if you're vicariously liable, you don't have the benefit of the immunity. Is that what you're saying? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what they are here? Aren't they vicariously liable? Well, there, there are there, and again, I think there's a distinction both between the the immunity that the employer is clothed with, and then the separate issue of culpable negligence as it applies to managerial and uh, policymaking personnel. So, in this case, though, what what they have clearly argued, without question, is that the is that the managerial policymaking personnel themselves have to have carried out the act, and so. And the part of the problem with that may be that this statute and this this case law, you know, mixes two two genres, so to speak. We're dealing with a criminal statute that's being um, interpreted and applied in a workers' compensation setting when the, the criminal statute wasn't, I, I suspect, and I think we can just safely assume, was not drafted with the anticipation that it was going to be applied to a workers' compensation immunity context. And that's why, in this case, we tried to direct the court to the the JC. Uh, case, which is a, a case, a criminal case, which which fairly directly addresses the issue of whether or not, um, or what the distinguishing factors are between um, culpable negligence in the exposure context 
uh, for felony and misdemeanor. And in that case, what the court makes very clear is, is really what's important is that there is an injury. That's what that's what distinguishes first and second degree uh, couple of negligence. Which may or may not be textually accurate, but that, that is, you are correct. That is what the law says. Yes, sir. And it, it is, it's a strange application. I would suggest to you, even as I read through these cases, I, I took the sense in some cases that um, the courts were struggling with how to how to place the, the pieces here. I don't know if you took that uh, reading as well, but it, it is what it is. It's what we so we got to we have to work with that vein of law. My, yes, my concern is is you brought up KC. I mean, look, if throwing a smoke bomb into a house like in KC, oh, or covertly disabling a riding lawnmower's uh, safety cutoff switch like in like in McCammy Oaks. If that doesn't rise to culpable negligence as a matter of law, how does not supervising, I guess it was a boom truck, um, how, how, does that, how does that meet the mark? Well, I think if you, and I, I believe we addressed this in one of the briefs, if, if in the lawnmower case, I think if you look at it clearly, it was the, the facts were not clear on a number of issues. But I think that the problem with, with that argument and with what the, what the appellees have argued here is, is if, if you follow this to its conclusion, it's such that there is no remedy. It's an illusory remedy. There cannot be um, culpable negligence for managerial supervisory uh, uh, situations. And oh, sure. At- I, I mean, I could I could envision a number of ones. You know, if if a manager, um, you know, if if a, a manager tells uh, somebody, hey, uh, you know, there's a, you know, we were just at. Uh, one of those miniature golf courses and they have a, a pit full of alligators that the kids can play with. And a manager directs an employee, you, you go in there and then, you know, kind of pu- pushes them into a, a gator pit to go fix something and they get hurt. Um, you know, they get bit or whatever, you know, yeah, may, maybe you got a, maybe you've got a, a, an issue there where that, that could rise to the level of criminal culpability such that you are deprived of your managerial workers comp immunity. Or as in, in the Conley case where you have, an airline that places a very unsafe aircraft into operation, or as in this case, where you have a, a company that takes a policy decision to place an untrained operator in, in the control of a very dangerous piece of equipment. And, and discovery might bear out that that occurred for a number of reasons. It could have been that that operator was uh, much cheaper than somebody who was fully trained and properly um, uh, instructed on the operation of this equipment in compliance with the OSHA regulations, much like an aircraft must be uh, in compliance with FAA regulations. So I think that I, I still would submit to the court that the ultra hazardous nature of this piece of equipment is a very, very important factor that distinguishes a number of the cases that were cited by the appellees. And I think on those questions, those are those are fact questions. That, that should be for a jury to determine. And the jury may determine that, that it was not sufficient uh, or it may be that it was. And certainly though, not at the motion to dismiss stage possibly at summary judgment trial, but I'd say at this early stage, it was, it was woefully premature. Um, and again, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, to beat a dead horse, but I, you know, I think if, if you look at uh, that distinguishing factor, that the difference between first and second degree misdemeanor, uh, we're, really, we're really talking about um, questions of fact that, that at this stage at the pleadings uh, uh, level have been sufficiently alleged. I think if, if the, com- the record and the, the complaint uh, make <laughs> clear that it's not just carte blanche alleged that they were uh, negligent, there are there are specific uh, allegations relating to uh, the, um, the manner in which this operation was carried out. Um, and I think that if you look at the, the cases that were cited by the appellee, if you if you look at all of them, they're they're they are really addressing summary judgment level, post-trial uh, level, um, where the evidence has been uh, developed and the record has been uh, built up. Um, I think, you know, the proper course here, with all due respect to the trial court, is that the, the case should be remanded. If, if the court is not satisfied that it has been sufficiently pledged, which I would, uh, pled, which I would urge it has been, then the, the plaintiff ought to be given the opportunity to, uh, to admit at this early stage. And I'll reserve the balance of my time. Okay. Um, you'll only have five minutes one way or the other. Okay, just so you know. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Henry. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court. 
Michael Henry, and I'm here on behalf of the appellees, Richard Overman and Robert Branch McClendon. I think there's a couple important distinctions in, uh, in Mr. Barnett's argument. Uh, it, it kind of conflated some of the issues here in the case. This appeal only centers on the culpable negligence counts against the two managerial or policymaking uh, employees of RBM Contracting uh, Services, LLC, that being Mr. Overman and Mr. McClendon. It is clear under 440.11 Florida statutes that the workers' compensation immunity is only lost for those managerial level employees if the conduct that caused the injury would also be a violation of law where the imprisonment would be more than 60 days. So it, it's a very high standard. Now, 440.11 does have a carve out, an exception to workers' compensation immunity for the employer if there's an intentional tort. And the language of the statute is clear there that uh, prior similar accidents, explicit warnings, things like that could satisfy for that ex exception of an intentional tort. But again, that is only for the employer. That's an important distinction because the Connolly case uh, cited by opposing counsel was an attempt by a, a personal representative of a deceased person who died when the plane crashed to sue the employer for the intentional tort. That case, it, it talks about um, 17 times that an engine uh, overheated in a four month period, 27 times that there was hydraulic leaks in a seven month period. You, you had this course of conduct and this pattern, but again, they were only trying to get around uh, the workers' compensation immunity to go after the employer, Arrow Air, uh, as an intentional tort. Culpable negligence isn't mentioned one time in, in the common case. The cases where culpable negligence, it comes into play in the workers' compensation realm are, are the cases that we cited. Um, McKinney Oaks uh, is, is very on point. There where the manager makes a decision instead of repairing the lawnmower to just take the kill switch off, disable it, um, over the objection of, of, of the employee, Medlin, uh, or, or over the objection of uh, the employee, the employee then a few days later is injured when the lawnmower throws, he's thrown from the lawnmower, the engine doesn't stop, blade cuts his foot. That was an active decision by a manager in that case that was not found to be to the level of culpable negligence. Similarly, we, we cited the uh, emergency one versus Kiefer case. The manager there, uh, knowing that um, electrical arcs could ignite solvent, uh, refused to get plastic bristle brushes that could, could be a, a better safety feature. Uh, instead, Ms. Kiefer was working with a metal banded brush Electric arc was created and, and the solvent uh, ignited burning her. Again, an active decision by a managerial or policymaking uh, employee uh, that was found not to be the level of culpable negligence. Here, it, it, we, we were at the motion to dismiss stage and it's important to look at the specific allegations in the, in the complaint. Um, the appellant never alleged that the boom truck was being operated by either Mr. Overman or Mr. McClendon. Instead, at least 12 times, and this would be in the general allegations and then once in each count uh, against the various different defendants, it was alleged that the, the boom, uh, the bucket boom mechanism was being operated by another co-employee, uh, John Doe Merle. It's also alleged at least the same 12 times that the boom truck itself was modified by RBM Contracting Services LLC to have a larger reach and a larger bucket capacity. No allegation whatsoever that it was Overman or McClendon uh, that, that did the modification or that was operating the machinery. Uh, again, we're looking at, at um, we're looking at decisions that they made, not actions that they actually took that caused the, in doing the injury. That's an important distinction when you look at 
the culpable negligence criminal statute. The, for imprisonment of less than 60 days, the language is that the action exposes to injury. Uh, the specific language itself is whoever through culpable negligence exposes another person to personal injury commits a misdemeanor of the second degree punishable as provided in 775.082 or 775.083. The second part of the statute is whoever through culpable negligence inflicts actual personal injury on another commits a misdemeanor of the first degree, punishable then by more than 60 days. That would be, it would be the, um, only in that scenario that you can get around the broad workers' compensation immunity. So the infliction versus the exposure. I, I think it's important that in both culpable negligence counts, counts eight and 10, there was an allegation by the appellant, uh, identical allegations that the appellees actively participated in said instruction and or exposed plaintiff to work and then around the boom truck that they're saying is inherently dangerous. So again, based on the allegations as pled, it was only exposure to uh, a potentially dangerous condition it was not an action by either Overman or McClendon in the operation of the boom truck that caused the injury. It was, it was a, another actor, uh, Burl, and there is a complaint, uh, there is a, uh, a cause of action against Burl in the still uh, remaining counts before the trial court. And there was never an allegation that the modification was anybody but other than by the employer. Again, uh, not conceding what will happen or, or suggesting what will happen at the trial court level, but there are counts against the employer uh, there that are for gross negligence. And that seems to be trying to get to the intentional tort to, to go after them to get around and the employer's workers' compensation immunity. Um, the, the JC case, and I, I just want to touch on that, uh, what was interesting there was uh, that was never a case where it was going to be a first degree misdemeanor that was charged against the minor JC. He was only being charged with, with a second degree for exposing to injury. And then in that case, they said since there was not an injury or property damage, it, it wouldn't sustain that. But the court also examined uh, in JC whether there would be uh, the action that was taken would have been known to potentially cause injury. So we don't think the JC versus state case or any of the criminal culpability cases that have been cited in either the um, initial brief or the reply brief are on point. And instead, the cases cited that are, are clearly on point when we're talking about workers' compensation are the McKemmy Oaks case, the emergency one case, uh, Byers versus Ritz, and also uh, the, the Kennedy versus Moray case. As far as the argument that uh, leave to amend should be granted, the problem that we have here is the complaint itself, the original complaint was 74 pages. It had uh, 11 different counts against eight different defendants. Throughout the complaint, as I mentioned before, there were identical allegations of who was operating the boom truck at the time of the accident, who modified the boom truck. And then after this uh, counts eight and 10 were dismissed with prejudice, at the same time, two counts for gross negligence, uh, counts seven and nine were dismissed without prejudice against Mr. Overman and Mr. McClendon. The appellant chose to amend the complaint within uh, the time before they filed appeal in this case. They did not reallege any causes of action for gross negligence against Mr. Overman or Mr. McClendon. Instead, they only proceeded on causes of action against the other remaining defendants. In that amended complaint, and, and that's in the record um, beginning Oh, 
in the supplemental record, I'll get to the page number uh, in a moment, they continue to make the same allegations as to Merle being the operator of the boom bucket truck at the time of the injury and that RBM was the, the employer who modified the truck. So the problem with allowing amendment at this stage would be that the appellant would have to allege a contradictory set of facts to what they've already put forward in this case. It wouldn't be adding additional facts to try to state a cause of action for culpable negligence. They would have to allege a completely alternative theory of facts and um, that would make this futile in this, in this case. Because the amendment we believe would be futile and because we believe that there was no conduct alleged that would rise to the level of a first degree culpable negligence misdemeanor, we believe that the dismissal with prejudice should be affirmed and the request to amend the, uh, and, and the case stand as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barnett. I Thank you, Thank you I, I think the, I guess the, the point I would, would like to drive home again is that is if you accept the appellee's argument, I would respectfully submit here, there, there is virtually no or very limited circumstances uh, that we could theoretically uh, conceive of where there would be liability. And I think, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is the, what is the, the purpose of policymaking liability? It, we're not talking again about scenarios where the policymaker has to go down and actually carry out the conduct themselves. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. There, there have got to be situations where policymaking individuals, and in this case, case, it was clearly alleged in the, in the pleadings that Overman was on the site. Uh, this is not, um, you know, such as a number of these other cases we have that have been cited to the court where these are, are completely remote individuals who are not involved on the site. This is a, a situation where it was alleged he was there. They participated in the policymaking here of how these, um, pieces of equipment were going to be operated. And I think if you look at, um, and, and Conley, I think provides us guidance here. I'm not saying that it's on point, but it provides us guidance here that we look to the pattern of conduct and has there been a sufficient pattern of conduct alleged to one survive summary judgment and get to a trial, but certainly at the motion to dismiss stage, um, the plaintiff ought to be permitted to develop that. Um, there's not a public policy argument here that's been made in the briefs, but I think it's more of a common sense one, which is we want to hold policymaking individuals to account if they fail to ensure that job sites are safe. Uh, in this case, this, this gentleman was catastrophically injured, had to have uh, emergency surgery, uh, and he squarely alleged that the policymaking individuals here put him in that place. Not that they passively just kind of let it happen, but they affirmatively were involved and establishing the policies and practices that resulted in his very serious injury. Uh, so we would respectfully urge that um, the court ought to reverse here um, squarely, but if not satisfied that the pleadings are uh, sufficient, uh, certainly be given the opportunity to amend without all rest. Thank you both very much. Well argued, thank you. Okay, our next case.